Good evening, everybody. It is Thursday, February 1st, and welcome to episode 158 of Buds and Blue Jays. This is your place for all things related to the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm Jesse Burrell, joined as always by Riley McConnell, and we are live on Facebook and Twitter. So if you are one of the several who's watching along and paying attention to us, like the video, leave a comment down below. We'll interact with you throughout the challenge and tell a friend. You know, it's getting close to baseball season. We're into February now. If you've got a friend who wants to be in on the Toronto Blue Jays, let them know and get them onto our show. Speaking of which, today on our show, we are going to do a more reaction to the Justin Turner signing, see if our thoughts have changed or if we've given some more research or maybe Ross Atkins' comments have changed our opinion on Justin Turner at all. And plus, we're going to continue our deep dive through the roster of the Toronto Blue Jays on this episode. We're going catchers and outfielders, and I know we're going to have a lot of spicy players to talk about on this segment, so make sure you stay tuned for that. And we got so much more stuff to come in this episode. But first, Riley, we're two days away from the Justin Turner signing. The dust has settled. How are we feeling about the move? I think I feel kind of more or less the same. I okay. think that a lot of a lot of people on Twitter in the rankings have Justin Turner um, seated fairly high as far as a lot of things go, and I guess that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, I don't I don't know if there's a lot of you know things that are going to be in his favor this year that is going to actually you know, let him be a top eight third baseman in baseball. I don't think he's going to play enough games to qualify as a top 15 third baseman in major league baseball. However, you know what? I can't be too, you know, disrespectful about the signing. Like at least we added depth. Justin Turner is a clutch bat. That is for sure. We really lacked that last year in driving in runners when it really, really mattered. So I guess Ju uh, Justin Turner for us, if he can do that, if he could do the same thing he did with the Dodgers for years and be that clutch bat, you know, for a one year deal. I mean, let's make it happen, man. We really, we really needed someone added to this organization that's going to do that. I really, mm -hmm. I, I really hope Justin Turner can be that guy because if not, then we have another gaping hole in, in our lineup and we're really going to struggle scoring runs this year. Yeah, I agree. I think my thoughts kind of paralleled that um, to a degree. We like the clutches. We like the postseason story. We like the fact that um, he is uh, he's a clutch hitter. He's been a guy. He's a good clubhouse presence, for example. Um, I think my main thought is there were some signs of decline in his game. He is now 39 years old. Father time comes for everybody. Um, I think he's still going to hit lefties very well. I still think he's going to perform decently. I worry about his um, his time against fastballs, and I worry about his approach against right-handed hitters. Um, I'm not so certain he's going to be the complete high-impact hitter, but he still should be at least league average, and he's still going to help lengthen out the lineup a little bit there, Riley. Um, in terms of the defense, I wish he could play third base more and full-time. Um, I really do. He was significantly bad there last year. He's been good in the past. If The Blue Jays roster looks a lot more flexible if you can even throw him out there with a glove every now and again, but I just don't think it's going to happen. It's going to be a full-time DH um, for Justin Turner. His projection, Riley, uh, 261, 333, 414, and 16 home runs. Uh, Steamer only projects him for a 0 0.7 war, but it is hard to accumulate war coming from the DH spot. So uh, do you think he'll be better or worse than that line this season? I think that's just it, Jesse. I mean, I really dislike wins above replacement for a designated hitter. Um, if you look at a guy like David Ortiz, imagine if he actually played league average defense at first base. He could have had mm -hmm. higher war numbers even. That wasn't the case. He's a career DH. Justin Turner putting up, you know, pretty decent war in the past. I think, I think point seven is even, you know, not that bad because – we know, I mean, we almost know for a fact we're not going to get 35 home runs out of Justin Turner. Yeah, and he's only at 27 is most in a season. I, and I mean, you do that, if you do 27 home runs for three seasons, which that is his career high um, over the spread of, I believe, six years, five or six years. But it's, it's, it's not ideal. And to have Justin Turner basically occupy the DH spot, this is the, this is the, uh, you know, the issue I have with this, Jesse, is you said it. The Blue Jays, you know, have a really versatile lineup. And I like that, you know, Biggio can play multiple positions and that Davis Schneider can play multiple positions. And, and you know, you know and, and Espinal can flip-flop in the infield as well if necessary. But that kind of, uh, you know, basically – Bogarts the whole DH spot and just reserves it for Justin Turner, who I think 
in a lot of people's minds is not an ideal designated hitter for sure. If the batting average um, pops and he ends up hitting around 300, that's a big win. And mm-hmm. I think that that point seven wins above replacement can be achieved. Um, anything over 15 home runs, I feel like is also a win for us. But again, if you're to compare him with league wide DHs, then I would assume he puts up, you know, half, half a, a war or, you know, maybe one win above replacement because it's not, he's not going to wow you in that stat. Again, I don't love war, especially when it comes to a DH spot. Um, yeah, but don't tricky. expect a ton there for, for Justin Turner. Uh, if he could compile a bunch of hits in, in, you know, post 80 RBIs with us, you know, I don't expect him to hit cleanup all year. I really don't expect him to hit cleanup all year. And if he does, and he succeeds at that, fantastic. I don't expect career high numbers for Justin Turner, that's for sure. But I would really like clutch at bats from him, some timely hits. I feel like the Blue Jays really need that. And and I expect him to, you know, be in the lineup more often than not. That's I think the idea with having Justin Turner on this ball club. He's gonna be played, played and simple. Yep. I, I just worry that 39 years old, the skills are declining. I just worried he's going to fall off a cliff. And if you get a shell of what the guy is, then I think that's um, where we can fall in trouble. The fans here, Riley, they agree with you to a point. They do think Justin Turner is going to be better. That line 58.3 think he's going to be better. 25 thinks worse. And I voted for the line being just right. I kind of think this is where the line is going to settle for Justin Turner. I still think we wish there was more of an impact here, but I think that's okay. The fans are smart. They know what they want. I really like the uh, the slash line looks great. Again, it's the 16 home runs at at the yeah. eight though. That, that that's that's really what gets you and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Again, if he could play if he could play, you know, um above average or average defense at third base, then we're talking a totally different uh war stat, but the fact is he's going to be a primary DH and maybe spend some time on a corner bag here and there. Um but yeah, his his job on this team will be to drive in runs and get timely hits for us. And I really hope that he hits well with runners in scoring position this year. All right, well, let's get into some of the other players because we have uh, five players we're going to talk about in this episode. Alejandro Kirk, Danny Jansen, and the three outfielders. And there is some very interesting players here. Uh, three to five of these guys had kind of subpar seasons last year. And we really need some of these players to be good this season if the Blue Jays are going to climb the mountain and have playoff success, which we really hope they should have. And this first one, Riley, Alejandro Kirk. And this is what he did last year. We know it was a down year for him. But he hit 250, 334, 358. The slugging was way down. Eight home runs, Riley. Last year was the first season. He also struck out more than he walked, which was something we've always talked about with Alejandro Kirk. The walk rate dropped. He chased more pitches out of the zone. And the quality of contact from Alejandro Kirk was abysmal. Exit velocity, launch angle, hard hit rate, barrel rate, all dropped. And his extreme contacts rates doesn't strike out much, but yeah, with the contract is dreadful to go along with him being a terrible base runner. And, you know, he's, he's good behind the plate, good at blocking, good at framing. That's what keep him in the lineup. But uh, I'm not very optimistic about a bounce back for Alejandro Kirk, but a lot of people and a lot of smart people seem to think it's going to happen. What is your expectations, Riley, for what Alejandro Kirk can do this season? And to add to that, 74 grounded into double plays, the most in baseball history. I'm just kidding. It was not that high, <laughs> although it did feel like it. Jesse, it Jesse, listeners, viewers, anyone who has spent more than 45 seconds on this show, because it feels like every 45 seconds, I'm saying something bad about Kirk, and I hate to hate on him. I really do. I want to cheer for this guy. The guy I'm going to talk about after Kirk, it's going to be mm-hmm. the, the opposite, because this is how I feel. We're, we we have a catcher that was an all-star catcher. And all of a sudden, and he's a young all-star catcher. I mean, Kirk came into the big leagues at, what, 21 years old? Very and, young. Yeah, in the COVID and, had, and, and, had, and had really good success. Um, we, were all, we were all high, and I'm thinking, like, this is, a, this is a guy who can give you quality at-bats. He's got a good eye. He's got a great, great job of, of putting bat on ball. And it seemed like he was actually – you know, getting quality contact at times, or if not, he'd send that bl- dumb little bloopy swing that would basically bounce into right field. Um, he, I would say at the least struggled last year, Jesse, and it seemed that the quality of his at bats really took a dip as well. The pitches that he was swinging at versus and taking, 
is is you know it's almost like he got impatient at at times at the plate uh and it, and it goes and it goes something like this Jesse like there's a lot of things to like about Alejandro Kirk I am an sure. old school baseball guy if my catcher hits ninth in the order um and and basically gives me 10 home runs in a th- in a 230 average then I'm I'm probably okay with that but we're we're talking about Alejandro Kirk this is a new era of baseball where we're actually seeing Baltimore's got a switch hitting catcher that has MVP credentials at, that could be at some point in his career. There's a lot of great catchers. Salvador Perez is a couple years removed from 48 home runs mm-hmm. this season tied with Vladdy catcher. The position of catcher is, is a very elite position. And I feel like um, we maybe slept on Alejandro Kirk early in his career. We maybe you know, overhyped him in, in a way he got off to a very hot start. And I think that might've clouded how maybe he actually plays. I think he had a down the year last year. I think you can probably compare his career stat line to be more of the lines of 2022, um, you know, maybe with a higher batting average season, because he does get balls, balls and hit balls in play. And if those balls fall for hits and he can, you know, maybe lag a ball out here and there, um, then he's going to, he's an above average catcher. I like, I don't think that Kirk is going to have a tremendous year next year, but I also don't think he's going to struggle a ton. I want to see him get bad on ball and, and take those smart, uh, plate appearances. Like he was where he's, you know, probably even forever. He wasn't pulling the ball too. I mean, slap hitting a lot. And I'd like to see him barrel a couple up, pull the ball, maybe, Maybe hit double-digit home runs. I probably don't see that happening. Eight home runs would be fantastic. Um, but again, I'm being hard on Kirk, even though you know I'm pretty easy on catchers as far as offense goes. Kirk's great defensively. Not even going to get into his his base running. And I hope he elevates. I hope he elevates the ball or at least hits the ball more on the line with solid contact this year. He's got a lot of potential um as as a guy who can get bad on ball and i and i hope that his stats next year reflect it i don't see a uh you know tremendous year but i also don't see a year where he t- hits under you know 270 and i hope that his on base percentage improves as well from last year and we could see more of an even split between the walks and the strikeouts I mean, he did just have a year, Riley, where he hit under 270. In fact, he hit 250 on the season last year. I might be in the low camp out of everyone else here. I do not see good things coming from Alejandro Kirk. Even in his silver slugger year where he was an all-star and he was really good, if you really break down that season, he had six good weeks. Now, in those six weeks, he was amazing. Driving the ball with authority. He looked like everything we thought Alejandro Kirk could be. But then we didn't see it for months at a time last year. We didn't see it much this year either. Uh, he had, I'm looking at his stats now. He was good in September and he was above average a little bit in the month of July. But even then, Riley, like the walks have gone down. The strikeouts have gone up. He's swinging and missing more at pitches he shouldn't hit. And even in that big year where he did hit a lot, I remember that um, he had like double digits infield hits. And for the slowest guy on your roster, that's just not going to happen. A guy's average is going to get increased with all these infield hits. Um, I am genuinely worried about Alejandro Kirk's um, at bats next year. I do not think he's going to be an impact player. I hope I'm wrong. I really, really do hope I'm wrong because the Blue Jays kind of need Alejandro Kirk to be a force with the bat. But at this point, I'm thinking he's not going to run well. And if he doesn't hit well, the defense is good. The defense can take you so far. But at what point does he become Jose Molina, right? And Jose Molina is great if he's your nine guy in your order and, he, and he's there and he's the only defensive weapon you have. But I just, I do not see a path where Alejandro Kirk can deliver a big offensive performance. I definitely don't think it'll be big, but if he can give you, I mean, what it was around the league with elite catchers, you got to go down the league and look at the, the Tucker Barnhart's of, of the league. Not everyone can be, you know, elite catchers. And I think as long as Kirk, um, hits respect, respectively, Mm -hmm. like as long as, as long as he can, you know, like I would say, I say 270, I know he hit what two whatever, two fifty two fifties last year. But I, I think he can do better, and I think that uh, you know some of those balls will fall from hits. Not everyone's going to have improvements in their numbers. If everyone did, then we'd win 114 games next year. Yeah, it's true. So that's that's not. True. It's just someone's going to take a step forward. Someone's going to take a step back. I think Kirk. You know, I think he's going to take. I can't even call it the step forward. I think he's going to crawl a little bit forward. 
um, and 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 get some some of those hits to fall. Um, and I hope, God, I hope he really um, it can elevate the ball a little bit. Maybe hit hit yeah. it harder and on a line. You know, maybe pull some baseballs for hits as well. Because I, I like the ability to hit to all fields, but things that only take you so far, especially with uh, the fact that he doesn't have great exit velocity is it's, you know, a lot of those are going to be grounded to double plays, ground ball outs. You know, if there's a runner on third and less than two outs and he scores, fantastic. But how often are you presented with that situation? I don't think Kirk is going to be, um, you know, a deadly um, bat in our lineup this year, to say the least. But I also think he'll be less of a liability than last year, or at least that's my hope. I'm optimistic, but again, I wouldn't put any money um, that Kirk comes home with the silver slugger next year in the American yeah, League. I agree. I'm going to take the under on whatever his home run prop is next year. And Craig, uh, listening in our fan here, makes up a good point. It looks worse when uh, Gabriel Moreno goes out and does what he does in Arizona and has this monster year, and we're here sitting here struggling about our catchers. Um, I want to go into what our fans think here. And our fans, really, they're optimistic about what to get from Alejandro Kirk. If you can see on screen here, 48.6% uh, of people think he's going to be better than the 276, 359 with 11 home runs and 3.2 war. That would be such a welcome experience if that does happen. We will talk about it if it does. Um, but yeah, I I'm glad the fans are seeing optimistic sides here on Alejandro Kirk. I voted just right for that one because those are very, I would take maybe less home runs. And I would increase, I would hopefully increase the on-base percentage. A 276 average is a, not a laughable thing. I think the slugging is going to be a little bit less. I think at, yeah. um, a lot of the times you're going to see Kirk, at the be some of his best games of the year, two for five, two singles, three RBIs, things like that. Um, again, I don't think he's going to pop off a ton. Yes, Jesse, yeah. you always refer to those six great weeks he had uh, in 2021, but it's, you know, it could happen. It could happen. He could get hot, and those numbers could reflect on, on the season totals. Let's move on to the next guy. We've got a lot of players to get to, and we're pressed for time here. And this, Riley, this is going to be a little bit more exciting, and I know you're excited, but that is Danny Jansen. We talked about one of the fallouts of the Justin Turner move is that this might mean less designated hitter at-bats for Danny Jansen for a team that desperately needs an offensive thump, uh, giving less at-bats to your player who, by the way, only trails Bo Bichette for a WRC Plus combined over the last two seasons. We want to give Danny Jansen more at-bats, and if the DH spot is being clogged by Justin Turner, that's less DH days for uh, um, George Springer, and then less at-bats in time for um, Danny Jansen as well. So um, we know the story here on Danny Jansen. 228 last year, 312, 417, but a career-high 17 home runs, and four of them did come in high leverage last year, which was the most in uh, baseball last season. Only played 86 games. We know Danny Jansen does have his injury concerns, so maybe that's why he doesn't play as much. But still, 17 home runs in 86 games. You stretch that out, that's a 25 home run hitter. Blue Jays need more of that this year. And he did only have a 233 Babbitt last year, so I'd expect um, even his batting average number to get up. I'm high on Danny Jansen. I know you are high on Danny Jansen, right? Lay our expectations for the 26 year old catcher this year. I, God, I love Danny Jansen. For a guy who, for his career who has hit 224, he might be my favorite player that hits under 230 <laughs> sure. ever. What is, I mean, Kirk, yes, defensively, Kirk is very good. So is Danny Jansen. He might not be as good at Kirk with the framing and things like that, but as far as what a team needs and what needs need to be met as far as what a catcher can do, I think Danny Jansen mm -hmm. does a fantastic job. He's a little more athletic than Kirk. I'm just going to throw that out there at the start. <laughs> and I love the fact, like I said, okay, I if I'm putting together a baseball team, it's, you know, the nine hitters, the catcher, whatever. Danny Jansen for me is not a nine hitter. And if he does, he's the most powerful nine hitter in all of baseball. He's played over a hundred games once. And yeah, he hit, he had 17 home runs and under a hundred games as a catcher. I think that's mm -hmm. fantastic. And I think he can do a, a lot better. I think he, Danny Jansen has a ton of potential. I love that he can pull the ball in the air with authority. Yep. And yes, he is a real it. home run threat. Danny mm -hmm. Jansen in the middle of, I'm not saying the cleanup hitter, I'm not saying third, but you slot him fifth in this batting order. And you have a, you the p opposing pitchers have a real problem on their hands. If we can put runners on base and Danny Jansen, was actually, actually one of the guys who could drive in runs last year. I really hope he stays healthy. Danny Jansen is criminally, criminally underrated. 
if mm-hmm. you, like I said, if you've ever listened for this show for more than five minutes, you know that I, for one, am a big supporter of Danny Jansen. I think he's, I think he's a tremendous ball player. He's been in our organization for a long time. Like I know that Kirk is good enough to be a starting catcher in Major League Baseball. I get that. Danny Dan- Jansen des- has deserved to be the Blue Jays starting catcher for I would say since 2020, 2021. He has deserved that role, and he has earned that role. And he's not going to get it this year unless Kirk falls off the wagon. I don't know if, if you know, that's going to happen. I don't think there's going to be as much of a sharp decline in Kirk's game. I love what Danny Jansen does on the ball field. I love that he is a homegrown prospect that has made his way through the ranks and is a power-hitting catcher that catches very good defensively as well. I mean, for a guy who, a guy who yep. hits under 230 in his career and has a career-high 17 home runs, like, yeah, those stats don't scream, you know, I'm a even an all-star because he hasn't given – he hasn't been given a fair chance, Jesse. And I just – honestly, you, it says free Danny Jansen. Get, he deserves some justice, man. <laughs> he goes to a bad team, and he's their cleanup hitter. It it drives me insane. I love having Kirk yep. on the team. It's great to have two catchers, yep. but I just wish – I just wish Jansen got more playing time so badly. Yeah, me too. If you're a Buds and Blue Jays fan, you know we're all about the Danny Jansen Express. Um, Riley, real quick, just give me an answer. Who has a better offensive season next year, Justin Turner or Danny Jansen? Danny Jansen. Danny Jansen. With you. Without Bingo. Hesitation. And we might be in the minority on that one too, but I really do think if the Blue Jays are going to maximize their offensive output this year, we need Danny Jansen in the lineup and we need Danny Jansen in the lineup all the time. He's not even that bad behind the plate either. He's, he's not like Kirk, but he's not even that he's bad. He's above so league weird. average. He's yeah. doing, he does just fine. All right. Well, let's see what our fans think for the stat line on Danny Jansen. We'll check in here. And uh, he's projected to 235, 314, 451, 21 home runs and a two war season. Riley, better, worse, lines just right. You know where I voted in there. I don't think I need to explain myself. I was part of the 50% for sure. As, As was honestly, I, yep. honestly, you know what? Even if it is, two, I think the slugging is, is going to be higher if that's, his, if that's his line. And the on-base could be higher as well. He does strike out a lot and doesn't walk a, and a, still a lot. Yep. But you know what? I, like There is a lot to love about this player. And I... I it's it's almost criminal. He isn't a household name in the Blue Jays organization, but that's just the way that it goes. He's been on our team for so long, and he's a he's a very I don't know him personally, but I'm gonna guess he's a very patient man, and he's a hell of a ball player. And I would love to see him get more at bats and get more innings behind the plate. I agree. I think we're expecting big things. Honestly, if we can get a contract extension done for Danny Jansen this spring, we would be very much on board with that one here. The next player on our list, Riley, is another polarizing one, and that is Dalton Varsho, who after we made the big trade with Arizona to get Dalton Varsho here, um, he very much underperformed in his first season. He hit 220, 285 on base percentage, which might have been the big draw with 389. He did get 20 home runs. He did get 16 stolen bases. We know the defense is elite. The defense is going to remain elite. And we know the base running is pretty good as well. Um, and I look under the hood. I actually spent a lot of time this afternoon looking into Dalton Varsho because if we can get a good offensive piece here, it's going to go a long way for the Blue Jays being good. His walk rates and strikeout rates, Riley, which are two of the main things I really look at in a player, actually were quite stable this year and his last year in Arizona. Um, he did make some changes in his first year. I think pop-ups were the big problem. He did hit the ball in the air way too much, including a lot of pop-ups. Which makes me think is actually okay because I think it's easier to fix that. It's just a swipe bat path change and you can really turn those pop-ups into line drives a lot more his exit velocity numbers all look very similar all of his contact stuff he still makes extremely hard contact in fact he had a baseball harder this year than he ever did in his career this will be what year five in the big leagues for Dalton Varsho I really do think that we could have a very high impact season coming for Dalton Varsho this year but I want to hear your take Riley your expectations for Varsho this season so I'm actually very calm when I say this because you said something a while ago um, that still kind of resonates with me, which is, you know, he's coming from a National League West team. He's a young player. Mm-hmm. Maybe let's let's say, Jesse, let's say for a second that that was his year to adjust. And I was just looking at the last year he spent in Arizona versus his first year as a Blue Jay. And minus, you know, the 27 versus the 20 home runs he had, um, like they're very similar numbers, um, you know, in the the basically the batting average and balls in play. Yeah, that's that's sucky. I like that he's hitting the ball hard. 
He's a power. He's a power speed combination. And mm-hmm. robbed of a gold. Robbed of a gold glove last year. He'll get one he, this year. The defense is a, is a story on its own. Really, he is a fantastic defender for a guy who was brought up as a catcher or whatever. He he's a, he's a hell of an outfielder if I've ever seen one. As far as that for a guy who's played catcher, I. I'm I'm very aware that we're not going to see a 280 hitter in 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 Dalton Varsho. If he was a 280 hitter, he would be an All Star every year with with the credentials that he has. I so how just, high then? How high do you think he can go? Like, what is the upside if we get if Dalton Varsho puts everything together? What does it look like? If Dalton Varsho can get everything together, I think we're talking 260, 265 batting average. And I would like to think that is 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 on base and slugging obviously going to improve with those numbers, but last year with an OPS plus of 85, Jesse, that's the kind of the yikes number that I'm looking yep. at. 15 percent worse than league average. Like if that if he could flip that around and be the better 15 percent, mm. um, then then we're talking then we're talking totally. Uh, different territories for a guy who who is a gold glover who is an elite outfield defender and who is a not necessarily a threat on the base pass but he is a plus member um of the blue jays base running crew something that we did not have a lot last year see aaron thinks he can get to 265 he also comments on here he thinks dalton is a dud but that's why we don't let yankees fans here on this buds and blue jays podcast uh not a thing we are dalton varsho stands right i think that power number could be much higher remember he did hit 27 in his last year in arizona and that was with a big surge late i do think 30 home runs could be the ceiling for dalton varsho and if he gets there let's check in with the fans and see what they had to say on our twitter page we asked them uh for the projection line on dalton varsho as I have Danny Jansen stats, so we'll go to Dalton Varsho here. 238, 308, 441, 25 home runs for Dalton Varsho with two and a 2.7 war. Remember, a lot of that coming from defense. Where do you stand on this line, Riley? I believe I voted uh, just right for this one. And okay. if anything, if anything, Jesse, I, I I would say 25 home runs would be, would be per, I have that just in line. 25 home runs, plus or minus two is okay. Um, I just... I'm not. I don't think we'll see a vast improvement, but Dalton Varsho is still young enough. I think he's heading into his age 27 season. Like, there's a lot to like about this player. The versatility. I, as a guy who really liked Ken Griffey Jr., who was a power speed guy, I won't yep. be blasphemous and say Dalton Varsho is anything like Ken Griffey Jr. Yeah, that would be a take. <laughs> but, but I really like the power speed combination as an outfielder, and I think there's a lot to like in his game if he can put it all together. I mean, in order for him to do that, he he's going to have to hit above the, the 220s. Like, he's going to have to live in a world where he can at least compete with a 250 batting average. And not only is that going to help his own numbers, we're, we're talking about players' individual numbers, which is all fine. At the end of the day, it's what's the betterment for the team. Obviously, the higher batting average of the player equals better for the team. And I think Dalton Varsho can be a really high-impact piece, yep. especially for his power. We just talked about, we just complained probably for the last three hours of air that we've had on air um, about how much we lack power. Dalton Varsho is a guy with power potential. And if mm-hmm. he can. Especially from the left side, which is important. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, especially if he can, if he can find a home in the middle of this order hitting, you know, maybe behind Danny Jansen and, and competing with that 250 batting average and, and getting some hard hit balls. Then we're laughing with them. He's an all-star level yep. player. All right, and let's we got uh, two more players to get to, and let's get through. And we're spending too much time on these already as it is. This next one's Kevin Kiermeyer. We don't need to spend a ton of time on him. I feel like we know what to expect from the 34 year old. We already did an episode basically where we talked about what our thoughts are for Kevin Kiermeyer on the upcoming season. Last year, his first year in Toronto, I'd say it was a success for him: 265, 322, 419, eight home runs, but. Had a 108 WRC plus in the first half and an even 100 in the second half. He was a league average player uh, with the bat. So if you take in his glove, he was exceptional. I think he was a two and a half war player for the Jays last year too. Made some great catches. I know he took a home run away on the home opener against Detroit, which is very good. He was 
uh, great in May and poor in June. And every other month, he was just league average. So I think that's kind of what we expect now. I do think, though, last year, Riley, we kind of got closer to the 80th percentile of offense from um, Kevin Kiermeyer. It was his best offensive season since the 2017 season with the Rays. So I would expect a slight downturn from Kevin Kiermeyer. But even if the defense is there, it sounds like he's going to be more of a platoon. He'll get um, shaded away from lefties a bit. He'll probably be in the lineup every day against righties a bit. And you have that defensive replacement. The sprint speed is declining, but it came from such a high spot that he's still a pretty fast runner. So I don't think we're worried about that there. The type of guy just every team needs on your roster. So what are your expectations for Kevin Kiermaier this season? It's funny you say that because Kevin Kiermaier is, as far as his defense goes, he's generational. Every team would love to have a center fielder who can patrol yeah. the outfield like Kevin Kiermaier. We're very fortunate. You can make the argument he's the best defensive center fielder the game has ever seen. Andrew Jones, but I'm going to continue right here. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Kevin Kevin Kiermaier is probably on the decline offensively. Like our team is our team is tremendous defensively. Like there is no argument to be made there. Um he's a lefty bat. Last year, like he did a fantastic job. We're talking about guys catching up to fastballs and things. I feel like Kiermaier hit a lot of fastballs square and pulled the baseball and I don't know if we're going to see that a ton this year. I'm just going to throw that out there. I don't know if we're going to see um, a, a batting average over 260. I don't know if we're going to see slugging. I hit over. I think it was the slugging was almost four tw- around 420, and he hasn't had the slugging since. What did you say? Uh, 2017. 2017 was the last time he slugged over yeah. 400. Like the, he is not a an elite hitter by any stretch, um, and, and and I don't expect him to be. Um, if he mm-hmm. can put together like just um just a smidgen off of what he did last year i will be more than happy and then the kevin kiermeyer we can say the kevin kiermeyer experiment up to this point has been an absolute success am i right like having kiermeyer yeah, on this I team has so. worked out like we we knew what we were getting like he has performed i would say above expectation for the most part and i think back that, for a one year deal too like there's no such thing as bad one year deal this will work out just i really even like if he doesn't hit I thought I would hate this him being from uh, you know playing for the Rays his whole career. I don't. I think that I think that he is a great piece for this team and I love another lefty bat in the lineup. Yes, he's he's not going to hit as well as Varsho, but he is a, it breaks up the right-handers in in the order. I think that is very important. And yeah, did I mention the defense? Kevin Kiermaier yes, is a great yes, guy to have don't. on this team. He played I, and again, it's you know George Springer is going to spend some time at DH. Uh Kevin Kiermaier played 100 games last year and he has missed significant time throughout his career um we'll see what we can get out of him let's like i'm gonna pull another quote from from moneyball as i do he we're gonna milk the last ounce of baseball he's got out of him and that's what we're doing with kevin kiermeyer I yeah. love this slash line, by the way, Jesse. Take it away. Tell us what you Yeah, have. the projections have him 243, 304, so pretty low on base percentage, 386. So they are projecting that slugging percentage to come down. Eight home runs, 1.2 war. It, it's going to really depend on playing time, how much time he gets. He does have injury concerns, even though he stayed healthy last year. But just really quick, Riley, what are your thoughts on this line? I say I say just right, even. Uh, slight, uh, maybe slightly worse. But I think that's pretty close to what to expect. I think that's pretty close, too. That's where we land up there. Um, I wanted to move through Kiermaier quickly because this next guy is going to be a bigger one to talk about, and that is George Springer. And George Springer, look, we know the guy he was for Houston. We saw him his first few years with Toronto. He was amazing, but there was some kind of concern from his performance last year. In this, in this last season, he had 258, 327, 405. He did go 20, 20, 21 home runs and 20 stolen bases. Right, I just want to read to you George Springer's OPS over OPS plus. So where 100 is league average. If you're 150, you're 50% better than league average. Um, over his last five seasons, he went from 150, 141, 141 again, 132, all the way down to 102 last year. He went from 32% better league average offensively to basically a league average bat. And that was with his highest BABIP since 2019. So you couldn't even say George Springer got unlucky. Walk rate drop, strikeout rate rose, two things I don't like to see. And the quality of contact from George Springer took a sharp decline. As one of my favorite stats, his Expo Bacon, which stands for expected Woba on contact, which basically just means how hard you hit the ball when you hit the ball. His And his average exit velocity dropped to the lowest in career. He did hit a ball 115 miles per hour an hour, so which is like, I think, second best on the team, maybe third behind Boba Shett. So there is still power in there somewhere. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I see a signs of decline for George Springer. And we knew when we signed him to that seven-year deal that we would be paying for some declining years. The Blue Jays need 
I, I almost say need. It might be the more important than even Vladdy getting back to MVP form. George Springer to hit for an elite, elite power seasons. I don't think it's going to happen, Riley. I, I want you to tell me otherwise or tell me what you think uh, we can get from George Springer this season. Well, I like to go with the latest statistics and we haven't played a game in 2024. So I have nothing but to look back at 2023 and, and simply go like this. Like the 102 OPS plus uh, is, is, is the worst of his career and, and kind of not even by a little bit. His OPS mm. under 800, I think, for the first time in his career, really. I mean, he was always, always a threat uh, of a high slugging, I believe, is what? He hit he hit 39 home runs in 2019. Like, those are big numbers. I never believed that George Springer was a traditional style leadoff hitter anyways. And, and again, he is he is on some sort of decline. I think if there, there was maybe a chance... Um, for some sort of revival in, in his career, um, you know, maybe last year because he, you know, we, he left the field in 2022, the last game, it was kind of a, almost a feel good when we got him back last year, we didn't know concussions yep. are a pretty serious thing. I should know. I have like seven George Springer. <laughs> like, got a he, didn't laugh at that. But... Had a, no, it's Hey, if, if you're going to laugh at anyone, laugh at me. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> but I mean, George Springer could have had kind of a, a, a fairy tale season last year. And it didn't really, I, I don't think there's anything wrong that way. I think the fact that it's just the age and the fact, and it's not even that he's that old. I mean, it's he's heading into his age 34 year with, Correct. if you, if you look at a lot of other players, around major league baseball and some of the best players, like they were having pretty good seasons at age 34. Like I I'm just like, just spitballing here. Like you can't tell me at age 34, Jim Tome wasn't squaring up and absolutely destroying a fastball. Yeah. Those are two different things, but I'm saying yeah. is George Springer's <laughs> decline coming like way too soon is, is what I'm saying. Like I get, I get that he's older than a lot of, of, you know, spry outfielders in, in Major League Baseball. Um, but to me, George Springer feels like a 37-year-old outfielder, not a guy who's heading into his age 34 season. He's been in the league a long time, Jesse. He put up some, and that's the thing. Num- he put up some crooked numbers with Houston. It was very good for us uh, when, when he was here. And then, and then last year was, is really the outlier. And, and, and I don't think, is it going to be as bad as last year? Uh, I certainly hope not. But again, I'm not. I'm not really, you know, thinking that he's going to do a, a, a heck of a lot more than what he did last year. And I expect him. He played 154 games last year, which I think is a ton. That was more than I expected. And I think he's going to get into less ball games, um, even. This so do year. I. And I think that's just. I think that's just normal. And we have, you know, I I, I want to say decent guys to you know take the bat the bat from George Springer in his absence um we I just hope that when he's in the lineup that he could go back to being the you know kind of that power guy whether he's the leadoff hitter or not you know this is a guy who who has a high slugging percentage naturally and last year was just kind of a flop and yeah the strikeouts rose significantly and like you said the walks were down yeah, I just think there's a lot of red flags. Once your like walk rate spike, you have trouble hitting the fastball, which George Springer did. I actually looked this up. George Springer crushed the four seam fastball in 2021 and in 2022. It was by far his best pitch. He was below league average hitting the fastball last year. And I've said it before. I said it with Justin Turner. I'll say it with guys again. The first sign of aging for a player is his inability to really catch up to that four seam fastball. And George Springer did that a lot. Um, a lot this time, but uh, yeah, I, I'm worried. I'm convinced that George Springer might be a league average hitter at best, and I'm not too certain that it's going to get much better, to be honest. And that worries me as a Blue Jays fan. Um, I want to bring up what the fans here, and then we can move on to some other stuff in the back half of this episode here. But George Springer is um, he's projected for 258, 333, 450, 28 home runs and three war. The projection system still believe in George Springer, so. Take that for what it's worth here. Um, I know I voted for worse. I don't know what you voted on this, but over 50% of the people in our poll thought George Springer would be worse than that. And after what we saw last season, I don't blame them. I I'm I don't want to say ashamed to admit it. I was definitely on a worse on the uh, I voted for worse on this one. And that's mm-hmm. not even a bad line right there. I, I I think that the power number, I think 28 home runs is, is- is steep. He hasn't done that since uh, 2019 when he hit 39. But again, there is a ton of of good right fielders in Major League Baseball. Um, it's he Jesse at this point in his career, 
He is a league average right fielder making $24 million and is on our books for a while. Uh, this this one we might have to we might have to suck this one up and hope that he can be serviceable in league average for us for the next three seasons. Mm-hmm. And then that's going through all of our outfielders there. Uh, look, we need these players more. We'll talk about them as we get into our X Factors episode closer into the season. We'll rehash some of these arguments. We'll talk more in detail about whether or not we think we can once we see these guys in spring training and see where things go. But I want to take a look down at the farm a little bit to see if there's any outfielders coming here. And I have four names in particular, Riley. And out of these four names, Cam Eden, Nathan Lucas, Alan Roden, and Zach Britton. Any of these four names, or you can even go to Son Brown, or if you have another guy who's circling the minor leagues, do you think is going to come up and be an impact player this year? I think I like uh, I think I like Cam Eden. I do like the name to Son Brown. I don't think he is a major league quality hitter. I think that Cam Eden could potentially develop into a bottom of the order guy who can who can run the bases very very well and give you kind of league average stuff. None of these guys are top prospects. I actually. I actually know more about Zach Britton, the left-handed relief pitcher, than I do uh, the <laughs> catcher, Zach yes. Britton, in our organization. I think Al Roden is, is you know, if he has a good year in He AAA, was interesting. He he made he, some prospect waves. He moved up charts last year. Yes. I, like, but no, again, not a guy who's, he's he still has some work to do. He'll have to Davis Schneider grind his way up to the major leagues. And at that point, it's, can you stay in the show or not? Um, yeah, I, Eden's an interesting one for me, an athletic outfielder. Um, the right-handed bat for his, his build, his type, I, I think that's fine. I would, if he's a left-handed hitter, then I'm absolutely kind of salivating at a potential kind of slapstick leadoff hitter type guy. But for Cam Eden to be a fourth outfielder type guy, a depth piece, if you will, um, if he can basically work on his bat to ball skills, develop an eye at the plate, then I think he's a, a fine depth piece for this, a little bit of a threat on the base pass. And if he can do, league average defense. That's what I'm asking for an yeah. outfielder. We'll talk about them when we get to our prospects episode. I really just wanted a name there. Um, Aaron Fagan, for your comment here, Dodgers versus the field. We are Blue Jays or bust, even though we hate our own team sometime here on Buds and Blue Jays. Um, look, I think every team should be doing what the Dodgers are doing. Every team has money, but that's that's a side conversation for another day. We got lots to talk about on this episode here, including this one, Riley. You and I are both video gamers. We do like to dabble, especially in the baseball world. Um, We've talked about Immaculate Grid several times on this thing. Uh, Out of the Park Baseball has been fun for us. We both played backyard baseball growing up. Baseball video games are not new to us. And um, there's been some Blue Jays related news in regards of um, for baseball video games. And that's Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is going to be the cover boy of MLB The Show. I did not think in a million years when this came across the headline that this was going to happen. I actually thought it'd be Ronald Acuna or Bust. He just coming off the 40-70 season. He hasn't been on the thing before. But no, the Blue Jays chose to go Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And I'll pull up a picture here on our thing. So if you're watching us on YouTube, you'll be able to see what the photo cover looks like. And I think it's pretty sick. Um, tell me what your thoughts are on Vlad Jr. here being named cover boy for uh, MLB The Show. Crazy. There's <laughs> there's a lot of... I, I love it. Listen. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff on the internet and I hate the toxic comments. <laughs> yeah. I, I say this, Jesse, you've never said that. Cause you obviously don't care. Our community, the people who do follow us and interact with us, you are all so respectful and, and kind, supportive, whatever, even if there are disagreements, I've seen a funny, you know, disagreement where basically people just agree to disagree a very healthy common environment and, and fan yep. base. I love that. Then I go on Instagram and Twitter and all these, you know, different social media platforms that have new cover athlete, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And I'm like, oh, man, I know exactly what I'm going to read down here. And Mm -hmm. it's just Vladimir Guerrero Jr. hate. And you know what? Vladdy probably got away with one. This probably wasn't the year to be a cover athlete yeah. for Vladdy. I think maybe after his MVP season, no, that would be the year no, to put him don't, on there. Hey, just, just let it go, man. We got a cover athlete. I think that's great. Did he deserve it? Maybe not. Is there going to be a fun – is there a fun intro with him and his dad? Yes. Is there going to be cool, you know, Diamond Dynasty cards and stuff because of that? Yes. Uh, should it have been Ronald Acuna Jr.? Most definitely. But we don't make these decisions. We are Blue Jays fans here. We play MLB The Show. We will buy the game. Canadians will buy the game. Americans Mm -hmm. will buy this game. Um, It it doesn't matter. This is... People get the games no matter what. Yes, people got snubbed. I personally love that it's Vladimir Guerrero Jr. I hope this encourages him 
to play like a cover athlete next year. Uh, he did make some comments too, saying this is our year. I, I don't want it to echo the last season was a trailer. Now you're going to see the movie thing because Vlad has gotten in trouble with his quotes before. So I don't want to say that. But from watching this trailer and watching some things, there are some Blue Jays related things I did pick up on that might actually be relevant to the season coming here. And here is a screen grab, if you're watching on YouTube, of Vladimir Guerrero doing his traditional hush as he hits the home run. But in the background, it might be tough to see. And I'll try to make it bigger for our friends watching um, live and on YouTube here. Um, you can see almost what looks like a different renovation to the stadiums. And I don't know if the people on MLB The Show know things that the general public doesn't know. But if you look at the right field line here, it kind of seems like the right field section. We knew they were getting changes done to that section of the seats, but it looks like they're almost layered. It does look like the seats are facing home plate now, which is something we didn't have before. Um, the spot in right field does kind of look the same. I know it's really tough to see if you're on there. No um, we'll, way, we'll Jesse. So. Great eye, yeah. man. So that looks I'm so curious. Real. Oh, man. I'm curious if know. this is I, what it means for the future of the renovations. I haven't here. snuck into the Rogers Center lately, but if that's how our right field <laughs> yeah. line looks, that looks like something out of owner mode from MVP Baseball 2005. That looks amazing. Oh, right. I love that. I don't even care about Vladdy doing the hush around third base. Show me more of that baseball diamond, man. That looks fantastic. I love that. If that if I walk into the Rogers Center, I traditionally love to sit on the third base side of things. And it's the I'm shady not, side. It's the smart one to be at. Yes, sir. You're not mm -hmm. supposed to say that, though. No, don't right. Give, don't <laughs> give away our secrets, Jesse. <laughs> Jesus, what are you doing, man? No, I would love to look at that, man. That that is like that looks beautiful, man. I'm stoked. Go out and buy the game. Do your immaculate script. Yeah. Play backyard baseball 97. No other backyard baseball because you don't want to get the pros into it. Roll with Pete Wheeler, Pablo Sanchez, Kenny Kawaguchi, and the rest of your favorite backyard baseball characters. You hear that baseball? Um, that's a free uh, shout out from us here at Buds and Blue Jays. Um, one more takeaway I did get from um, watching this thing. There was a photo. I don't have the photo here, but it's of Vladimir Guerrero looking away and he's wearing this jersey. But as you can see, he was wearing a white hat. And uh, we had a comment early in the episode that um, Stephanie is just here for Riley's fashion advice. So here's your segment, Stephanie. We're about to get some fashion advice from the Riley McConnell. And uh, I'll pull it up on screen here. The Blue Jays are getting new hats, and I'm, I'm curious, Riley. This is different than any hat the Toronto Blue Jays have worn before in their franchise history. It's, it's got, like, almost pinstripes coming down the side. I know you and I are, are team curve brim, so the flat brim might not be uh, the best look for us. But, yeah, I want your advice. What's with these hats, and are the Blue Jays going to wear them this season? So I get a new hat, Jesse, and, and you're not, and you go to Lids, you can't, it says the sign right there, don't curve the brims, and it's like, okay, like, I know what size head I am. I'm going to curve it. I'm going, first thing I'm going to do, Jesse, I get this hat. I take the sticker mm -hmm. off it, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't make music. I play baseball. Then I'm going to curve the brim <laughs> to my liking. And then, Jesse, I'm going to throw this right in the garbage and light it on oh, fire. Woo! This is an abomination. What am wow. I looking at, dude? This is an awful, awful looking hat. Mm. Man, That is just that is just an eyesore. It's not even a white. That is like a cream colored hat in those stripes that come down the blue and the red. Oh man, that is an absolute eyesore. I hope they never wear that. Just stick with the white panel. That works. That looks good. This does not work unless they've made horrific jerseys and pants to go along with it. I don't want to see that in any of the nine innings, in any games, in any game this season. Wow, what a take there. Um, yeah, and even Aaron Fagan listening says, it's bad. We agree with you. White hats are not it, dude. I, I don't think I own any white hats. I did have a Blue Jays white one with a red panel there. And you're right. The stripes do make it feel like the Montreal Expos, which, hey, we do love the Expos. Let's leave that style of thing for the Montreal Expos in case they ever do make a comeback. Not with our Toronto Blue Jays. And Riley, while we're on the point of cosmetics and how things look, I've got three Toronto Blue Jays who have been putting in some work in the offseason to do some things and that are, might be a little different. And I'm going to start with the first one. This is a guy in the batting cage, and it's a player we know. We haven't talked about on this episode, but we did talk about on last episode. And that's Kevin Biggio getting some swings here, Riley. He is facing a lefty, too, pitching to him off the pitching cage. Um, it's about a 30-second video of Kevin Biggio taking some swings here. Do you got a takeaway? Do you got a thought? Or do you just like, hey, Biggio's in the cage. He's getting some work done. What are your takes? I love it. I love I love that he's in the cage getting some work done. I really wish he would get rid of that hand waggle there. I think he's got to be. Yeah, Isaac doesn't that, like it either. No, he's got to be a quick to the ball hitter for him to be successful. Honestly, bat closer to the shoulder, elbow down, 
quick to the ball, snap, snap of the wrist uh, kind of hitter. Like, I get that. It's more of a power stance swing. Sure, whatever. I like to see this. If he can develop, you know, and I think, hey, Jesse, you could argue. Like, I think that was a great year against lefties for Kevin Vigio. Perhaps mm-hmm. he's trying to make himself more of a complete ball player. And I love that. Like, there's, there is no set lineup right now. Guys will be competing for jobs in spring training. And for Biggio to be a member of the starting lineup is nowhere out of the question. I love that he's in the cage getting work because that's only going to – that's going to help him. That's going to help the team. And mm-hmm. if it gets him more playing time and he stays hot, stays in the lineup, then then we'll be talking about him, man. I'm sure we'll be talking about Biggio. He's going to be one of those X factors too that we talked about quite absolute- a bit. He is an absolute – all right, so what about this next one? Because we're not done here. And this one's one of my personal favorites. This one is um, a guy just, just hitting the weight room, Riley. And that's our boy, Yusei Kikuchi. Now, I don't know if you're a, a gym goer, Riley, or if you're a guy who types likes to do deadlifts, but Yusei Kikuchi is lifting some weight here. Look at him go down. Lift that thing. You can see the bar physically bend as he goes down. Uh, my main takeaway from this is Yusei Kikuchi is already in Florida. And he's already at the complex training. Like, Yusei Kikuchi grew a beard and got better last year. Now imagine that he's jacked and even stronger. Like, look out, Major League Baseball. Sai Kikuchi here is here. And he's coming for you, baby. No, you actually can't. It's, we're just going to assume that this is Yusei Kikuchi. We can't obviously yes. see him. All we see is his backside. He looks like he's a pretty good team. Look at those calves. Those just yeah. solid, Strong solid calves. calves man. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There he is. Yep. Yeah, it lasts a little bit less of a beard. Um, maybe he's trying for a more um, clean look, which is all fine and dandy. But, um, Jesse, I like that he's at the complex. I like that he's working out. I know how well he pitched last year. Like, he wants to replicate. He wants to put together a performance where he is basically um, – going to wrap with three other starters we know that are going to be in the rotation they can put together some solid quality innings together and we can Jesse why the heck is the music still playing oh yeah good question I forgot to mute that so uh, my apologies to the audio listeners there who are <laughs> it's that, all right uh, it gave me technical kind of difficulties here you know what, if, he can work out, if he can work out to this kind of music I can get pumped talking about him getting pumped with the music he's getting pumped literally I'm getting Figuratively, and yeah, Jesse, I know you love using on the wall there, and yep. yeah, I expect I expect good things from him. He puts in he puts in a lot of work. Here last year, I don't know if he top those numbers, but he's gonna do some. And one more player, this player we haven't talked about much since his signing, and that is Yariel Rodriguez. Now, the latest update on him, because his signing is still not official yet, we are still just waiting for his um, his visas from the Dominican and stuff to get through, but he's working out here as well. Here's our first look at Yariel Rodriguez, who, remember, did not pitch at all last year, but he is in Cuba, he is training, he is going through, he's going through it, putting in the strength to make sure he's ready for this season. So, uh, first look at Yariel Rodriguez, I guess, behind the scenes. I like this. I, this is kind of a movie thing, you know, the way they've the edited It's like a Rocky it. montage, yeah? It is It is a little, but a little darker. This is like if the Rocky montage like had a lot more uh, kind of somber death stuff. Although Adrian did die in the uh, after Rocky V, which was very, very yeah. sad. I love Rocky. I love Rocky. Anyways, this kid's going to be good. I don't know how we're going to use him. I, I think that's up for grabs. Like, I would like to see him... Develop, he's going to develop at the major league level. I think that that I think we're almost safe to assume that at this point. I hope he has a very successful spring training, and he's going to get a lot of looks at spring training. He knows that all eyes are on him. He wants to crack this Blue Jays lineup. I don't know if he'll crack the rotation, but there's a very good chance he could be a good weapon in the bullpen for us. And just he can never have enough pitching. We're uncertain of how bullpen pitchers pitch year to year. We have a solid right-handed thrower available to us. And if he and if he does well, we're going to use him, plain and simple. Yeah, and then going on to some minor news and notes as we get through the last five minutes of our show here. The first one, Kevin Biggio, just as we just saw there, um, just had his jersey retired by his high school team. Um, I'm still waiting for my PECI baseball jersey to be hung in the rafters at uh, the gym there at PCI maybe one day, but congrats for Kevin Biggio. So no one at his high school in Texas will be able to wear his jersey again. We also had some other things too. Um, the Blue Jays did hire a bunch of new coaches. There are a lot of the names you'd expect here. Uh, Casey Kandel will be the manager down in Buffalo. 
including um, all the usual names here. Nothing too crazy. New Hampshire, Cesar Martin will be the manager with uh, Jake McGinnon being a bench coach, uh, Joel Bonnet as pitching coach, and Mitch Huckabee as hitting coach down there. In Vancouver, Brett Lavallee will be the manager. Um, Austin Bibbins Dirks, who I think is an Australian guy who is a pitcher, he will actually be the pitching coach down in um, Vancouver for this season. Shout out to the Vancouver Canadians. And down in Dunedin, Jose Magora will be the manager, followed by Matt Von Romer and Corey Roden as the bench slash pitching coach. And Nash Knight will be hitting coach. A bunch of other names on there. Nothing too, too crazy to report. Um, the Blue Jays did sign a knuckleballer, Riley. And I remember um, knuckleballers are always fun. 25-year-old Jordan Powell, just a name to remember. Um, it's a guy who can throw a knuckleball. We do have a video clip. We tweeted out from our Buds and Blue Jays page. Go take a look at that. And some sad news here too. Jimmy Williams, who was one of the first mo- uh, managers for the Toronto Blue Jays, he passed away at the age of 80. Sad news for Jimmy Williams there. But I threw a smorgasbord of stuff at you, Riley. Any main takeaways out of any of those? Yeah, uh, it's good to see Nash Knight can be a, a, a coach in professional baseball because he certainly didn't pan out as a prospect. I think he yeah. was probably 30 years old, 31 years old on the New Hampshire Fisher Cats. Um, yeah, a lot of names on there, Jesse. Um, sad, you know, we talk, throw stuff like that. And then, yes, Jimmy Williams did did pass away. Um, I mean, a lot of a lot of baseball people have have passed away in the last I, I feel like last three or four years. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's never good. 80 years old as uh, is a is a good life. But uh, I'm not someone who is great at talking about death. So I'm just going to roll on the next one. Do you? It's yeah. it's that I, I, you know, condolences to his, his family and the Blue Jays organization. Um, it, never easy. And one more thing, keep it less than a minute here, Riley, but um, some breaking news just as the episode got started. The Baltimore Orioles finally did something this offseason. They just traded for Corbin Burns, and honestly, they didn't give up too much to get them. So if you're keeping tribes at home, that's a former Cy Young Award winner that just went to Baltimore. The Yankees just got Juan Soto. Tampa Bay, look, even though they got rid of Glass now, they're still going to be good. And even the Red Sox are doing things. And our big moves, Justin Turner, Isaiah Kiner, Falefa. My main takeaway from all this, Riley, is Willie Adamas has got to be on the Blue Jays at third base. We got to do something. I wonder if the Blue Jays are really waiting for the prices to go down so they can see if they can get one of these guys on a one-year bridge deal. But I don't think uh, Scott Boris Klein is signing any of those. I don't know what it is, but um, Ross Atkins has got to get creative. Do you have a thought? 90 seconds or less on um, the Corbin Burns trade to Baltimore. I'll, I'll make it just a lot easier. You, and add Verdugo to that list of guys. I know he stayed in the same division, but him going to the Yankees as a lefty bat's big trouble. Yeah. No, we 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 have not competed as far as the market goes this year in the offseason. I made that very clear for the last couple episodes. Um, there is still a chance that we're a very successful club, but we're going to have to work at it. Our guys are going to have to come through. But yeah, when you see a guy... A, a Cy Young Award winner at that, and you know, two years removed, Cy Young Award winner in Corbin Burns, who could very well go out and win the American League Cy Young next year if he is good um, on a team that is young and going to compete. Jesse, as of right now, we're in a lot of trouble. Things need to get better for us. We need a little bit more luck and a little more transactions to go our way. Yep. Well, that'll do it for our episode here today. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you for all the people who made their comments on Facebook, who tossed us the like, who tossed us the shares. We appreciate you. We see you. Baseball season is coming. We are into the month of February. Um, we got some good fashion advice from Riley McConnell. And uh, don't buy white hats if you take one thing away oh, from the don't. episode here today. Or white shoes. Never buy white shoes. Yeah, that too. I have white shoes, but they're strictly my gym shoes, so they're not too bad. They're um, meant for tennis and barbecue and Jesse. <laughs> love that. Noted. Write that down. Um, please make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, uh, anywhere you can find your podcasts. You can find Buds and Blue Jays. We just threw up a little uh, montage on the Justin Turner signing on the socials, so make sure you go check those out as well. You can see all that. We will be back next week to talk pitching, and if you thought our takes were interesting on Alejandro Kirk and George Springer, wait till you hear what we have to say about guys like Jose Brios, Yusei Kikuchi, and Alec Manoa and others. So we'll make sure we get to that next weekend. Until then, we'll see you guys next week. Let's go Blue Jays. Thanks, guys. Uh